I am extremely excited about uh, this teaching next year, uh, uh, what we're going to be doing and having uh, for, for ourselves a week, not next week, but the week after that. Are the monitors on? Need them off, please. Uh, the week after next, uh, we'll be going into Jerusalem uh, in the triumphal entry of Jesus. This is where we are in, in the study. And so we're, I'm looking forward to that. And what that means is that from the week after next until Easter after Easter, we're going to be studying the very last week of Jesus Christ, the, the events that took place uh, during that time. Uh, and what, what that means is, is that we're going to be so in tune with, so intent in, so knowledgeable of those events that led up to his crucifixion and his resurrection. And so, so we, we're going to have just an exciting time uh, this year studying the gospel according to Luke. Now for today, where are we in today's time? Uh, in real time, Jesus is only a few weeks, I mean, excuse me, a few days out of entering into Jerusalem. Just a very, very short time. Uh, the day would probably be Thursday where he would be crucified on Thursday week or the Friday after that. That's when he would be crucified. So he is only like a, a week and a day out of crucifixion. Uh, this is where, if it is Thursday, where we're looking at today, prior to the crucifixion, then one week from this particular time, Jesus is going to be in the upper room having the last supper, is what we call it. So, so this is where we are in, in, the, in real time, according to that. And he's on his way to Jerusalem. He's passing through Jericho. We're going to talk about that a little bit more uh, in a moment or so, and the event that led up to this, uh, to, to this specific moment. So that's where we are in, in real time. So let's read Luke chapter uh, 19, verses 1 and 2. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there <clears throat> by the name of Zacchaeus. Now, what, what I really want you to see here is, is Zacchaeus is the target. Uh, Zacchaeus, you don't pick that up when you're just reading it, but, but Jericho, going through Jericho is about Zacchaeus. We'll, we'll see this as, as I'm just pointing it out. A man named Zacchaeus, and he was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. Now, as I pointed out last time, which was really last year, but only a couple of weeks ago, that that. Jericho is the new Jericho. It's not the old Jericho. It's, it's not the Jericho where the walls come a-tumbling down. This is the new Jericho. The old Jericho is an archaeological dig today. This is the new Jericho, and it's, it's there now. And Jesus is entering, and he's passing through Jericho. And what I want you to realize and, and, and kind of get a handle on, and it is very loud up here, but what I want you to understand and what I want you to get your handle on is, is, is that what Jesus is, is doing is, is there's this energy that's at Jericho and what he's experiencing here and what's going on. Uh, already, there is, it's just prior to Passover time. You know, it's prior to the week of unleavened bread. And, and, and so people are coming from everywhere, going down Jericho Road, going through Jericho. And, and, and so it's holiday time for them. You know, they're, 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 they're experiencing, they're going to the big city Jerusalem. They're going to see the magnificent temple of Herod that, that Herod built for the Jews. It's a, it's a wonder of the world at that particular time. And they're excited about holiday and that winter's over. And we kind of understand that, you know, sometimes that winter's over and it's time now to go on vacation. And this is what they were doing. So there was already this anticipation and this excitement. But add to that that Jesus is passing through. Now, now Jesus, is, he's a celeb. He is the most popular person in the whole nation. Everybody's heard about Jesus. They're going to get to see him. They're, he's coming through. They're going to be up close and personal. They're going to, and there's no telling what he's going to do. So, so they're excited about that. He's coming through there. So that's, that's exciting as well. But add to that, that he has only minutes prior to this healed a blind man, miraculously opened the eyes of a blind man. And, and I'm going to talk more about that shortly. But, but that has gone through there like wildfire. It is spreading. Jesus is coming through, and he's just healed blind Bartimaeus. J Bartimaeus can see now. And this is, the, this is the excitement and the energy level that's going on as Jesus is coming in, in, into Jericho. Now, I need to talk just a few minutes about Zacchaeus. I want to hurry up and get through it as quickly as I can, because what I really want to show you is, is toward the end of our, of our study. But, but, uh, but Luke makes sure that he, we see a couple of things about this guy named Zacchaeus. And it was very interesting to me as I began to prepare for this. In all of my years of ministry, 30 plus, 
you know, years of teaching Sunday school and teaching and studying the Bible and all the things. I've never taught that I can recall, never taught about Zacchaeus. Never taught about him. Uh, it, it's, that's pretty amazing to me. So I'm, I'm excited about getting to do it as well. But he tells us a couple of things about him. First of all, uh, he, he's, a, he's a tax collector, but he's a chief tax collector. And, and only, the only tax collectors that are named in the Bible are Matthew, the disciple or the apostle of Jesus Christ, and Zacchaeus. And I love it when the scriptures do this, when they name people. Because what this does is verify and authenticate the Bible. In other words, when Luke wrote this, he says, if you don't believe me, his name is Zacchaeus and he lives in Jericho. And he's the chief tax collector. Go ask him. I love it when the Bible authenticates itself like, like it does here. So, so he's a tax collector, but, but also, you know, he's, he's wealthy, he's prominent, he's influential in town. So I want to kind of ask you guys a, a question. Um, if, if you could choose between being wealthy and, and, you know, and, and, and influential and prominent or be poor and be, uh, you know, basically a nobody and, and, you know, and, and, and not prominent, which, which would you choose? W would you be like me and want to be wealthy and, 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 and prominent and, and influential? Well, I, I would. So, so and really is better than R, right? That's what Ford says, you know, that, that, that and really is better. And what I want you to see here is, is that this guy, Zacchaeus, is living the life that most of us would want to live a wealthy, influential, prominent life where, where we mean something, where people, people recognize us and, and, and respect us or know who we are. So, so this is the life that, that this guy is living. That's the first point that I want to make sure we, we get about him. But also, he's not only a tax collector, he is the chief tax collector. Now, what does that mean? A, a chief tax collector, he's over all the other tax collectors. In the, he's at the top of the tax collecting pyramid, and which shows us why he's wealthy, which shows us why he's influential, which shows us why he's prominent. But we don't understand how those people hated and despised tax collectors. We, we really don't relate to that. But they were seen as traitors. And when it came to tax collectors and evil, they had their own category. It was tax collectors and sinners. <laughs> I mean, this, they, they, weren't, they weren't just sinners. They were tax collectors and sinners. They were despised. They were hated. They were seen as traitors in town. Uh, they, would, they, would, they would go around taking money from their own relatives, their own friends, their own countrymen. And they hated these people. They hated tax collectors with a passion. And so Zacchaeus is at the top of the tax collector pyramid. He was really, really hated and, and, and despised in, in town. And we don't relate to that. You know, we, we gripe about paying taxes, and Jesus says we ought to pay our taxes. But, but we gripe about them because we pay between 20% to 50% of our income for taxes, and that's, that is a lot. But, but imagine, say, uh, in, in, our, in our case, because what they had to do is pay taxes to the Roman Empire. So, so to kind of relate to that just a little bit, say that China conquered us. China invaded us and conquered us. And now they rule us. And what taxes we pay now are going to go up. They're not even going to go up for Americans. <clears throat> They're going to go up for China. Our taxes are going to go to China. What's good about that? Right? So, so maybe we can understand that. So they hated these guys. So imagine that somebody lives in right here in our town that we know becomes a tax collector and comes pulling up into your driveway to get taxes from you. How do you feel? I hate you. And, and this, is, this is how they were feeling. Because they were going to, they would put you in prison if you didn't pay your taxes. Somebody you know. Somebody you grew up with. And this is how they felt about Zacchaeus and, and all tax collectors. But the people saw these guys as living the lives of a god. You know, they, they lived the lives. They had the big mansion houses and the fenced-in areas and the walled houses and, and, and those kinds of things. They had the best of everything. They had the best wine, the best, best clothes, best houses, best mules. You know, they collected mules. They, you know, they, 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 they had everything, and they were... They were seen like this to the people, but they were so despised and so hated because they had, were taking money from people, their own countrymen, and becoming wealthy themselves with it. So they were despised, and, and, and they were despised and hated like that. So this is the person that, that we're talking about, and Luke wanted to make sure that we understood this because it sets up the, 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 the story that we're going to be looking, looking at here. Now, finding an honest tax collector would be like today trying to find an honest politician. They just don't make them. 
I, 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 I read, a, uh, well, actually, I, I, I heard it on the news where uh, congressmen now, <laughs> they're all millionaires. They don't go in as millionaires, but they come out as millionaires. Now, how did that happen? Did they, did they do that by honesty and integrity? So, so this is the person that we're, that we're, we're, that we're discussing here and that, that, we're, that we're talking about. So he's a, he's a chief tax collector. Now, what I always attempt to do when, I, when we hit something like this, I try to show you in the scriptures where there is a, a chapter break, where there shouldn't be a chapter break. And, and what I want to do is, is point this out to you. What, this is what we have here because and I think it sets up what takes place immediately. What happened as Jesus was coming into Jericho is he encountered this blind guy at the end of chapter 18. His name was Bartimaeus. That's what Mark tells us. His name is Bartimaeus, and he encounters this blind guy who hears all the commotion as Jesus is coming by with the caravan, and he says, what's happening? What's happening? The blind guy does. And, and they tell him, Jesus, uh, Jesus of Nazareth is, is coming by. And he begins to shout out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. They tell him to be quiet. He gets all the louder. And, and finally, Jesus stops and calls the guy to him, says, come here. Tell him to come here. So he throws off his cloak and he goes to Jesus and Jesus asks him this profound question. What do you want me to do for you? And the guy says, I want to see. I want to see. And so right there, Jesus heals him. And this is sets it up. This is the very last verse in the, in the previous chapter that runs into here. Because if you're like me, when you're reading the Bible, what, you, what you'll do is you'll You'll read along, you'll come to the end of a chapter, you'll put your bookmark in, close the Bible. When you get to come back and read it again, you'll pick it up. And you'll lose the context. And so this is, this is to help you there, but also understand this story as well. So this is the last verse of, of chapter 18. It says, immediately he, Barnabas, received his sight and followed Jesus, praising God. Now, I don't know how that looks to you. you know, how does praising God look to you? I mean, this guy is rejoicing. He has gotten his vision back. You know, I see him jumping. I see him praising and twirling and shouting. I see him praising God. But it doesn't stop there. And when all the people saw it, they also praised God. So what we have going on here is this caravan of people praising God. We have a parade going down the main street of Jericho as Jesus is coming through. This is what I want, want us to see. Now, now, this is a lot of noise. This is a lot of commotion going on. You know, if I was in my study back there and I heard it going down Main Street and I heard all the commotion, I'd go out and see. And this is what's happening. People are coming from everywhere. What is going on? What, Jesus is coming through town. And I would go out there, and I'm not a parade person. I, you know, I, I don't, I'm not a nosy person. I don't really go see all this stuff. But, but I would go to this parade. I would go and see Jesus. I would, I'd go out there, I'd climb a tree to see this Jesus. And this is what happens. This is what happens here in the next verses as we read. 19 verses 3 and 4. He, Zacchaeus, wanted to see who Jesus was. Now, I've got to emphasize this. He did not know Jesus. He had not met Jesus. He wanted to see who Jesus was. He wanted to see who he was. But being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree. I don't know what that is, but he, read, he knew where one was. And he ran ahead and he climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. Now, our little criminal, and I can't ever... Think about this without thinking about Danny DeVito, you know? I mean, to me, he's just the, the perfect character. Uh, uh, you know, he would, he would play a good part in this, in this, in this story. He, he's Danny DeVito. And, and so this is what, he has two problems. One is there's the crowd, and the crowd don't like him. And they're not going to let him through. They're not going to let him get up so they can see Jesus. <laughs> they want to see Jesus. So he's not getting through the crowd. And the second problem that he has is he says, it says he's a short man. So, he, he, you, you know, you can, you can imagine him you know, jumping to try, try to see. He can't see through. He can't see over. So he comes up with a solution. And, and the solution is to run down the street where he knows that there is a tree. There's a sycamore fig tree. 
And obviously it has low limbs. And so, so he's going to go down there and he's going to get in this sycamore fig tree so he can see Jesus. Now, now just imaging Danny DeVito running is, is funny to me. You know, that's, that's funny. But running in a robe where he has to pull it up and run. And, and then Danny DeVito climbing a tree. Now, now that cracks me up. That, that is hilarious, you know, to see this happening. You know, here he goes, he's going. And why did he do that? Why was he so, in, I mean, this is a crook. Why would he be so serious about seeing Jesus? What's going on here? It seems to me that a, the last person a crook would want to see is a, a rabbi, possibly the Messiah. What, what's happening? You know, I was thinking about this. You know, we have the potential, don't we, to categorize and pigeonhole people. We, we, we say, God will never deal with them. <laughs> God couldn't save them. You know, and, and Jesus told the parable, we studied it back in, in, in chapter 18. We called it the, the pastor and the pimp. What the parable really is about is the Pharisee and the tax collector. And the, and the, and the moral of that story that Jesus told was, you can't tell what God is doing in somebody's life by their external appearance. Right. Right. See, the Pharisee looked the part, he dressed the part, he prayed the part, he talked the part. <laughs> But he wasn't. He was not righteous with God. On the other hand, the Pharisee, uh, the uh, tax collector, or the pimp, beat his chest and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus says, that's the guy who went home justified. That's the guy who God was really dealing with his heart. And we make snap judgments about people. And this is what they had done with him, and it, it'll show up again here in just a little while. But, but this, this person, Zacchaeus, was not going to allow his stature to stop him from seeing Jesus. He was intent. He was serious uh, about seeing Jesus. So he, he recalls where there's a tree. He runs down the road, and he, be, he climbs up this tree. Now, now, climbing a tree is not something you do inconspicuously. You know, you don't climb a tree in secret. I mean, if, if, and there's a lot of people around, and they all know who Zacchaeus is. He's the chief tax collector. And he's probably the best dressed man in town. <laughs> It'd be like today, somebody wearing a $1,000 suit, climbing a tree to see Jesus. You, you, got, you got to giggle at that. You got, you, you got to kind of laugh at that. But it shows us the seriousness of this, of this little criminal who is already categorized as, as a nothing. And so, so here he is, he's, 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 he's down there, and he's climbing the street. Now, why is he so serious? What's going on here? All right. There comes a point in our lives, if we're serious with Jesus and serious about God, where we don't care anymore how we look, how we sound, how embarrass, we embarrass ourselves. We, we don't care. We drop all of our pride and we climb a tree. We do, we do amazing things if we're serious about seeing Jesus. We'll talk in tongues. We'll jump and shout. I can't sing a lick. I'm not going to ask you to vote on that or anything. But I'd be bad if I could, but, but I can't sing a lick. But, but on Sunday mornings, I bell her because I don't care. I don't care what you do. I'll bow because I want to see Jesus. I'm serious about Jesus. And, and, and when you want to see Jesus, you drop your pride and you climb a tree if you have to. So what is it that you do what is it how is it that you see Jesus what, what are you willing to do to see him so he, here he is so let's read the next verse now. verses verses 5 and 6 so when Jesus reached the spot there's our title when Jesus reached the spot and what I need you to do is say that back to me would you, would you say that back to me on the count of three, when Jesus reached the spot? One, two, three. When Jesus reached the spot. One more time. When Jesus reached the spot. Why am I, why, why am I emphasizing that? Because 
We all have a spot. When Jesus reached the spot, that's our title. He looked up and said to him, what did he say to him? Zacchaeus. How did he know his name? They had never met. Zacchaeus wanted to see who he was. They'd never met. He looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. And here's how I, I see this. And I think I'm accurate and I think it, it'll add and, and help us understand what's going on. So Zacchaeus is up his tree and he has a bird's eye view, <laughs> literally. And he sees Jesus coming, Bartimaeus out there, who was once blind, and Zacchaeus knew him. He, he sees Bartimaeus out there praising God, and all the people shouting and praising God, and they're coming down in this huge parade, coming down Main Street, and he sees this happening. And the way I envision it is, is the, the, uh, the disciples are around Jesus, the apostles, protecting him from the rush, because he's the, he, he is the celeb, and, and everybody wants to touch Jesus, see Jesus, shake Jesus' hands. Everybody's got their problem. They want Jesus to help them. So, so they're, they're really working and working and working here with, with, with you know, trying to protect Jesus just a little bit. So he's coming down and he's coming down Main Street. So he sees, he sees him coming. And when Jesus got to the spot, what did he do? When he got to the spot, what spot? What's the spot? The spot's the spot of embarrassment. The, the spot is the spot where you don't care anymore. The spot is the spot where, where you'll do anything to see him. The spot is the spot that, that you've come to, that many of you have come to in your life and in your walk with Jesus Christ where you wanted to see him so desperately. Nothing else mattered. <laughs> When Jesus got to the spot, what did he do? He looked up, right? Now, when Jesus looked up, what did everybody else do? <laughs> now, if he had somehow gotten up that tree <laughs> secretively, it wasn't a secret anymore. Everybody looks up, and there he is, a deer in the headlights. You know, he is there. What do you do? You're Zacchaeus. What do you do? What do you say? What do you do? You fall out of the tree. You, what do you do? Hi, Jesus. <laughs> Jesus says to him, calls him his name, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. Come down immediately. I must. Zacchaeus, I came through Jericho for you. I must, you're a must to me, Zacchaeus. I must go to your house today. I must. What did he do? What did Zacchaeus do? He came down and he welcomed him gladly. <sighs> I love it. I love this part. You see, it's a divine appointment, it's a divine encounter. Many of us have had. Jesus knew his name. It's a divine appointment set up. See, you don't have to introduce yourself to Jesus. <laughs> He's known you way longer than you've known him. He's known you from the foundation. <laughs> Romans 8 says that who he foreknew, he also did predestinate. He's known us. He knows your name, and you're a must. He must go home with you. He, he comes here, and, and we don't have to introduce, you know, Zacchaeus thought he was climbing that tree so he could see Jesus. <laughs> you know, he wanted to, he was seeing, he, he did all this so he could see Jesus, but, but in reality, what was really going on here is Jesus was seeking Zacchaeus. Jericho's all about Zacchaeus. Jesus came through Jericho for Zacchaeus. Jesus came through Lafayette for you or, from, or through Somerville or through Rock Spring or, or through Ringgold. Or, or, or he came through there for you. You had a divine appointment. Now you think you're just coming to see Jesus. He's coming to seek after you. 
The Son of Man comes to do what? To seek and to save. We think we're seeking him. He's actually seeking us. And from, from the time of the Garden of Eden, with Adam and Eve, God is all about seeking the lost. Adam, where are you? And we all have a point. We all have the spot. The spot where it just does not matter anymore. I don't care what people say about me. I don't care how silly I look climbing that tree. I don't care anymore how, how silly I look running in a, in, a, in, a, in a gown. It doesn't matter to me. I don't care how silly I look praising God's talking in tongues. I want to see Jesus. You see, Jesus does the saving because Jesus does the seeking. <laughs> he can do the saving because he's the one who's really doing the seeking. And he says, I must go to your house. Zacchaeus, you're a must for me. I, I, this is all about you, man. I, I want you to know I must go to your house today. You know, <laughs> it's a divine necessity. You know, I, I was, it was interesting because Jesus didn't ask him if he could go home with him. What, what did he say? I must go home with you. We, we think that, don't we? We think, well, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll let Jesus in if I want to. No, you won't. <laughs> if he wants to go home with you, he's going to go home with you. <laughs> And we, we, you know, we, we have this little image of him standing at the, in, in the book of Revelation, you know, in chapter 3 at the, at the church of Laodicea, knocking on the door, saying, let me in, let me in. No, that's a church. There's a lot of churches he can't get in. <laughs> but if he wants into your life, he'll put you up a tree. It's a divine necessity because in verse 10, where we're about to read it in just a few minutes, he says, today salvation has come to this house. Jesus not only knows who you are, he knows when salvation comes to you and to your house. It's about you. You're a must. And this is, this is what, 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 he, what is he, he's experiencing here. He must. It's, it's a divine necessity. And, and, and Jesus never comes alone. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know he's, got, he's got this massive crowd with him, but I know it's, it's, it's Jesus alone isn't going to Zacchaeus' house. It's at least going to be Jesus and 12 other guys. Right? And when he comes into your life, it's just not Jesus and you. He's going to bring some characters into your life, into your house, into, into your world. And if you, if you have truly seen Jesus and he went home with you, there are some characters in your life. I'm one of them. I love this. This is, this is just so cool to me. Right? Now, now, okay, so, so Zacchaeus is all up, up about it, but, but let's, let's read this verse. Verse 7, all the people saw and began to praise God because God had reached out and, and touched the sinner who was doomed for hell. Hallelujah! Is that what it says? <laughs> what do religious people do when you hang out with sinners? What, what do they do? They mutter, they put pictures on, on Facebook about you. They, they, you know I'm right. <laughs> call, call me? <laughs> do, do you know what? <laughs> oh, they mutter. We've studied this word before. They, religious people. This is, he, he has gone to, to be the guest of a sinner? <laughs> My goodness alive. They're apostate fakes. Religious people are mean. They're the meanest people in the world. They'll criticize you. They'll talk about you. They'll mutter about you. They mutter about Jesus. It always amazes me how this rolls out because whenever Jesus has these huge crowds following, and this is a prelude to what's going to happen in a couple of days as he enters Jerusalem, this, this, this is, but, but when he has this massive crowd following, he always does something to like shoo them away. I mean, he does, doesn't he? Every single time he, he does this. Do, do you remember in, in, in John chapter 6 where he's fed the multitude, he's fed 5,000 people. That's just the men, not counting the women and the children. And, and, and they're going to make him king. Yeah. 
uh, 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 10,000 people, we're going to have you as king. He says, uh-uh. So he, he goes across the, the lake and gets away from them. They follow him around there, come over the next morning for breakfast. And, and, and he says, no, I am the bread of life. It's not the food, it's me you got to eat. you got to eat my flesh, you got to drink my blood. Do you know what that massive crowd did? Uh-uh, we're gone. And then he looks at his disciples, and what does he say to them? You want to leave too? I really believe that Jesus does this on purpose to test us. Are you real or are you religious? Because there's going to be things that are going to happen in your life that you're not going to like, and you're going to mutter about them, and it's Jesus doing something. (laughs) Do you remember the first time it was when Jesus went home with you? It was okay if he went home with you, right? But he ain't going home with that guy. He ain't ain't going home with Zacchaeus. Judy and I had the opportunity a couple of weeks ago to go down to see one of my old friends. He, he, uh, we went to grammar school. Back then it was junior high. Uh, In high school we went to college together. We roomed together. We drove together. We lived together for all these years. And he had a a, a brain tumor. And, And I wanted to go see him. He had an operation. And so I went to see him. And, and, uh, and, and we sat there a couple of hours talking, and, and one of the topics that came up was Delbert being a preacher. See, in my circle, <laughs> I was written off to be a preacher. There's no way Delbert's going to be a preacher. <laughs> they wrote me off, but Jesus didn't write me off. They wrote Zacchaeus off, but Jesus hadn't written Zacchaeus off. And we have got to learn, not, because there are Zacchaeuses in your life and in my life, people that we say, God, can, he's just, he can't do anything with this person. Yes, he can. He's God. And by limiting God to dealing with the life of somebody else, we're limiting God to dealing with our lives. We're saying, we're saying well, he can't forgive me. He can't forgive my child. He can't forgive my friend, my loved one. He can't, he can't because, because he just can't. No, he, you're limiting your own faith. When you time stamp somebody, they had limited. Listen, likely somebody wrote you off. But Jesus didn't. Because one day you wanted to see him, and he's passing by, and he found you up a tree. And he called your name. He says, Come down. I want to go home with you. If you let me go home with you, I'll bring salvation not only to you but to your whole house. (laughs) So, let me finish this up. I don't know how time speeds up. Luke Luke, uh, 19, verses 8 through 10. But Zacchaeus stood up. No, he's, he's, Jesus is at his house. Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, (laughs) He, he's not, he wanting to see Jesus. Now, now he's seeing the Lord. Here and now, immediately, right now, I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody of anything, I'll pay it back four times the amount. Whew. What did Jesus respond to that? Today, salvation has come to this house. <laughs> you don't do that. Unless <laughs> today salvation has come to this house because this man, and he gets a little complicated, so, because this man too is the son of Abraham. What is that about? A son of Abraham. For the son of man <laughs> came to what? To seek and to save. Who or what? Which is the bigger? Who or what? <laughs> what? He didn't come to save you. He came to save whatever you're about. Now, now what I got to do, I got to explain. He, he, he said he's, a, he's the son of Abraham. Now, what he said is he's a descendant of Abraham. Uh, Abraham was the first Hebrew. So it's the Hebrew nation is, is who we're talking about here. And all the descendants, all, and, 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 and specifically at this time, the, the Jews. And so what he's saying is salvation has come to, to this house. To, to this Jew, 
Now, and my point that I want to make sure that we get here is the Jews are not saved. I don't, I don't care how many goats they kill. I don't care how many Passover lambs they kill and eat. I don't care how many ashes they sprinkle of a heifer. I don't care. They are not saved. They are lost. Jesus specifically says, does he not? I am the way. I am the truth. I am the door. And if you try to come in some other way, you're a thief and a robber. This is what Jesus says. In, in Acts chapter 3, there's no name under heaven by which men must be saved. So, uh, he, listen, until they receive the real Lamb of God, they're not saved. Jews are lost. They think they're saved. They're far from God. And he says the Son of Man. And in our study that we've been looking at, we've learned that the Son of Man is speaking about an event. It's an event that's horrific. It's, a, it's a, an event of desolation. It, Jesus said it's, it's like the days of Noah when the flood came. It, it's like the days of Lot when hellfire and brimstone came. And it's going to come on this generation. So what Jesus is saying here to Zacchaeus is, Zacchaeus, you would have been consumed in desolation that's about to come upon this generation. But because of me, because you have, have uh, received salvation, you're going to escape the desolation. And what I want to point out here and just say to you and me, listen, when Jesus goes home with you and you really get serious about Jesus and he's come to the spot the, the, in your life, when, when that's happened to you, you will escape a lot of the desolation your generation is going to go through. You can escape it. What was, a, what's, what's, what's extremely interesting to me here is, is Jesus didn't tell Zacchaeus to quit his day job. <laughs> now, this is a horrible job. He's taking money from his countrymen and giving it to the Roman Empire. He didn't tell him to quit. Right. He, 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 he did, he, he, what was said here is, is Zacchaeus says, I am going to stop cheating people and I am going to start caring about people. I'm going to be benevolent. I'm going to, I'm going to give to people. I'm not going to just be a taker. This, this is what is, is really said here. Maybe, you know, let me, let me attempt to, to explain. I mean, you know, how did that roll out when when Zacchaeus started giving back people four times what he had cheated them out of. I mean, how, how, how did that look? <laughs> so, so let me do this. You know, uh, you know a, a husband comes home from work, and he says, Honey, do you remember that guy who, who made us pay taxes, and we had to use our savings, we had to use the children's college fund, and, and, and or he was going to put me in jail? Do you remember that guy? Well, of course I remember him, she said. A little guy, a little shrimp. Yeah, I remember him. I hate him. Why do you ask? Well, he came by work today. He did. What do you want, more taxes? Well, I thought so when I first saw him, but, but that's not. He apologized to me. Well, he did what? No, he didn't. <laughs> yeah, he did. And he came and he says, I am so sorry I cheated you. And he says, what I want to do is I want to give you back four times what I cheated you out of. No, he didn't. Yeah, he did. Here it is. Whoa. He said he had a guy come to his house named Jesus. And he's changed. And honey, he is changed. What do you think then the people that were muttering about Jesus going home with Zacchaeus, the tax, what do you think they were saying now? Well, hallelujah, praise God. I get my four times. And what's so amazing here is Jesus got a rich man through the eye of a needle. See, Jesus said it's more difficult for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to go into the kingdom of God. But what's impossible with man is possible with God. What we've got to do is we've got to stop time stamping people. We've got to believe God is working. We just got to get them to the spot. And when Jesus gets to that spot, he's going to call them by name. How about you? How about you? Um, have you cheated anybody out of anything? Huh? Have you billed for hours you didn't really work? Have you, 
Have you overcharged people for labor you really didn't do? Have you taken something that wasn't yours? What are you going to do about it? What about this one? Um, have you stolen time, taken time from your spouse or from your children or your, your grandchildren? Ouch. Ouch, ouch, ouch. Can you pay that back? No, but you can, you can do something. Are you generous or are you greedy? Do you care about people or is it just all about you? Where are you with this one? You see, it's like every week we come in here and we climb a tree because we want to see Jesus. <laughs> and all the time, we think thinking we're coming to see Jesus. Jesus is coming to save us. And I really believe that right now, this moment, that he's at the point, the spot in your life right now, this minute, and he's calling you by name. And he's saying, come down immediately, right now, today. You're a must to me. This day is all about you. I want to go home with you. And if you'll let me go home with you, it won't just be you and saving who. It'll be saving your household. It'll be saving the what. You'll be saving everything you're about. I'll save in your, work in your finances for you. I'll work in your family for you. I'll save those. Kind, I'll, I'll save you from so much desolation that's going to come on every generation. But you can avoid it. Today, salvation has come to this house. How about you? All you have to do is welcome him happily. Let's pray. Father, thank you for our time. Thank you for this moment. Thank you for Jesus coming to the spot in every one of our lives and being who only he can be. With your head's bowed, your eyes closed. You know I don't do this every, every week, but I'm going to do it today just to feel like I should. But you, is today the day he comes to your tree. What will you do to see Jesus? Maybe you've gotten away from God. You're not where you know you ought to be. And you're back up the tree again. Or perhaps you've never had Jesus. Perhaps you know, you've never taken Jesus home with you. Perhaps salvation has never come into your life or to your home. Is he at the spot today? Is he calling your name? Is he saying, you're a must to me? If that's you, you're away from God or, or you've never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior. He can change from Jesus to Lord. If that's you, would you, right where you're sitting, just me looking, would you slip your hand up and say, yeah, pray for me, pray for me. Anyone? I see a hand. Any others? I see a hand. Any others? Any others? Quickly. I see a hand. I see you. Amen. Father, 